Okay, we've dealt with the medical causes of respiratory distress and broken them down into pulmonary disease and cardiac disease. This third video, we're going to start discussing surgical disorders. Now, this first one is just a simple case that you see a dilated upper esophageal pouch with air distally. This is esophageal atresia with a distal fistula. Generally, they don't really present with respiratory distress unless they happen to aspirate significantly either over the larynx or if they happen to be unfortunate enough to have a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula in addition, in addition to their distal tracheoesophageal fistula. But you still have to discuss this under surgical lesions even though the lungs really may or may not be involved. This is another patient that happens to have esophageal atresia. Uh, in this case, you can see that they actually put a tube in and it's starting to make a U-turn in the dilated, blind-ending upper esophageal pouch. This patient does have lung disease, but he's probably a very mild TTN. Uh, for some reason, generally, you don't see significant evidence of aspiration in these babies. Uh, and we have an occasional uh, newborn that may go days or even weeks without that diagnosis being suspected or made, and that's amazing. Uh, how clear their lungs and how asymptomatic they can be. When people discuss esophageal atresia, they always include H-type fistula in the classification even though there is no esophageal atresia. Obviously this patient doesn't have esophageal atresia, he's got an NG tube going all the way into the stomach, but he does have what could easily fit the picture of aspiration, he's got right upper and right lower lobe infiltrates. They strongly suspected an H-type fish on this baby because he did tend to cough when he was being fed. So we placed a feeding tube into the upper thoracic esophagus and injected non-ionic water-soluble contrast under fluoro. And you can see, how number one, how close the trachea and esophagus are, which is often seen in H-type fish, so they're tethered, tethered very close to each other. And you can see this, this contrast was not coming from the larynx, it was coming from the esophagus. So this was a classic H-type tracheoesophageal fistula. I think I alluded to this in, in, in an earlier talk, but the one thing that tells you you're dealing with an underlying surgical abnormality is there's not going to be symmetrical aeration of the two lungs. And often there's going to be mediastinal shift to the right or to the left. This is one of the most common surgical lesions that we're called upon to evaluate, and that's a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. They're usually on the left side, 75%. There's usually a tremendous mediastinal shift. This is cardiac border going all the way to the right chest wall. You can see his trachea shifted to the right, the esophagus shifted to the right. Uh, this is your classic appearance of a boctolect hernia on the left with no aeration of the uh, of the uh, ipsilateral lung because it's so hypoplastic. This is not a difficult diagnosis to make and there are very few things that can look like it. Similar example of the same disease, uh, except you can see there is some aeration of his right lung. Uh, this is a cardiac, you know, uh, margin shifted all the way to the right. There's no aeration of his left lung. There are no air-filled bowel loops in the chest. But here's his umbilical vein catheter coming all the way over here and then trying to head back towards the, the inferior, vena, inferior vena cava. So this is another classic left-sided diaphragmatic hernia. More often than not, it's a boctolic hernia. Tremendous mediastinal shift to the right. Again, the only thing that can theoretically look like this that I also consider a surgical lesion is a massive, a congenital massive left pleural effusion. It happens, it's rare. Uh, especially uh, congenital chylothorax, uh, more rarely is a congenital hemothorax from a traumatic delivery. delivery. Diaphragmatic hernia is certainly more common than either of those two things. And again, the pediatrician would probably point out to you that clinically the, pa the patient's belly is, is scaphoid. Usually babies have a protuberant ab abdomen. If they have a classic diaphragmatic hernia, they often have a scaphoid abdomen. Okay, this is a more classic left-sided diaphragmatic hernia. You can see all the bowel loops in the chest, the stomach bubbles in the chest. Uh, I'm sure there's some liver in the chest because, again, I think this is the umbilical vein catheter that he happened to have in. This is his umbilical artery catheter, which is going to go to the right, 
because the aorta is shifted along with the rest of the mediastinum. This is not indicative that he's got a right-sided aortic arch. You can see the tracheal shift. Okay, even though right-sided diaphragmatic hernias are only 25% of the cases, uh, they can be just as severe. Uh, usually a right-sided boctolic hernia, uh, they don't do as poorly. In fact, they may not even be picked up until a, a, a later age because sometimes the liver actually plugs the hole and prevents bowel loops from getting up there. But often the liver itself just goes all the way uh, uh, to the apex of the pleural space. So you can see he's got no aeration of his right lung. He's got tremendous mediastinal shift to the left. His trachea is way over there, as is the esophagus. His heart shifted over. Uh, this was a classic uh, right-sided boctolic hernia. Uh, notice no bowel loops were actually involved. It's a very unusual case because you swear there was space here for a liver, so then what would be going up here? But this was a proven uh, right-sided boctolic with the liver occupying almost the entire right pleural space. This is another example of a right-sided diaphragmatic hernia. The only thing different about this case is you actually see some aeration of the hypoplastic right lung. Often you don't, but it just may be a matter of, of when in utero the severity of the herniation increased. If there was some development of the uh, ipsilateral lung, you may see some aeration, especially if they're on positive pressure, as this baby is. But you can see he's got tremendous mediastinal shift, trachea, uh, and uh, esophagus to the uh, left. This is another patient with a uh, left-sided boctolic hernia. And the only thing that's different here is you sort of see a sharp uh, margin right here, which looks like it could be diaphragm or bowel wall, and there is some aeration of the hypoplastic left lung. Usually, usually if, if you see this much aeration of the lung and the bowel sort of confined by a thin membrane, it's probably because there is a pleuroperitoneal membrane or so-called sac. So this would be the classic appearance for a left-sided boxelec with a sac. They'll usually be a lot less symptomatic. You can see the development of his right lung is relatively good. Uh, so he's got good aeration of his right lung. He even has aeration of the ipsilateral hypoplastic lung. So even though he's intubated, you can sort of imagine that he was much less sick, much less mediastinal shift to the right. So whenever you see that much of what looks like a diaphragm, uh, always assume that it's a boctolect that happens to have a pleuroperitoneal sac. Uh, and hopefully they will do better, although obviously still has to be repaired. This is a patient we had relatively recently. Um, what you can see here is that there is evidence of some mediastinal shift to the left. You can see his trachea is starting to bow a little bit to the left side. Here it looks like you might be looking at a diaphragm or maybe the dome of the liver. It doesn't look like there's the normal amount of space for a normal liver. Uh, you can see that there is a pacification of at least the lower two-thirds of the right hemithorax. It's not a complete whiteout. It's not the same as the liver. So is this a posteriorly layering pleural effusion giving you the asymmetry of the two hemithoraces? That would be unlikely in the face of mediastinal shift. You have to have a pretty much more significant effusion than that to cause mediastinal shift. So we weren't sure exactly what was going on here, and we thought, well, is there a mass down here with aerated lung behind it? Uh, or is this a hernia with a sac? Uh, we don't do them. We don't do them very often anymore. But in this particular case, we thought maybe the lateral view would uh, help us out. And in this case, it absolutely did. You can see here's the anterior part of the right diaphragm. Here's this water density structure, sort of rounded, and then you lose the whole posterior aspect of the right diaphragm. So this is in the classic position of a right-sided boctolic hernia, and that's exactly what the patient had. Uh, you know, we did an ultrasound not long after this cross-table lateral, which proved there was liver way up here. And so it was true there wasn't a normal space for the right lobe of the liver. So even though it's an unusual appearance for a, a right-sided boctolic, that's exactly what he had. You know, in the old days, we used to routinely do lateral views for all babies with respiratory distress. We don't do that anymore. But if the AP uh, film is not clearing the issue well enough for you, Sometimes a lateral is very helpful. And I should really point out at this time, because I don't have an example in this PAC system, but let's say you have a baby that has unexplained hyperinflated lungs, uh, or they have uh, unexplained 
uh, elevated CO2s or respiratory acidosis. Sometimes you can have a mediastinal mass or, or uh, some kind of mediastinal problem that's so small that you don't really detect anything on the frontal view. And this is particularly true of a, of a vascular ring, specifically double aortic arch. You're not going to see much on an AP film necessarily with a double aortic arch, but on the lateral film, you will see focal narrowing of the trachea. Uh, and that w that is what gives you the obstructive emphysema of both lungs and explains the patient's uh, respiratory acidosis, high CO2 level. Uh, so if the AP film alone doesn't answer what may be going on, especially if you have a patient that has really clear lungs, but they're chronically hyperinflated for no good reason, always do a lateral chest because it may answer your question. Rarely, you can actually have a small mediastinal ma mass that's compressing the trachea from without and also causing the obstructive emphysema because of the underlying tracheomalacia that results in most mediastinal masses in newborns are going to be pretty big and they're going to be pretty obvious on the AP chest radiograph. Left, mid, and upper lung field look clear and this is the classic appearance for a congenital lobar emphysema in this case involving the left upper lobe. They will often start out more opacified because they're filled, the lobe, the affected lobe is filled with lymphatic fluid. So they start off with a more opaque hyperinflated lobe with mediastinal shift and they slowly evolve into a hyperlucent hyperinflated lung lobe with mediastinal shift. Uh, left upper lobe is supposed to be the most common lobe involved and I think followed by right middle lobe and then right upper lobe. So this is a classic left upper lobe congenital lobar emphysema, and that's exactly what they found at surgery. This patient also has mediastinal shift. This is, this is lung herniated across the midline, and the heart shifted to the left as well. Notice the minor fissure looks elevated. This is congenital lobar emphysema of the right middle lobe. I don't really have a follow-up here to show you but that's exactly what they found at surgery. If you notice, it's opaque. You almost get the impression you see sort of dilated lymphatics within that lobe, and that's exactly uh, why it looks opaque early on and then gradually clears as that lymphatic uh, uh, fluid is cleared. And again, supposedly, uh, depending on what series you read, supposedly the right middle lobe is the second most common lobe involved with congenital lobe emphysema. It's extremely rare if it occurs at all for an entire lung to be involved. It's almost always confined to a lobe. This is a patient that obviously has asymmetry of the two lungs. Uh, by the way, before I go any further, I, you know, I will say that the most common reason for one lung to look a little bit more opaque uh, in a focal area or even diffusely is just to have simple atelectasis of the entire lung or a lobe or a segment. But generally, that's not what you see on the very first film on a patient unless they have like a unilateral intubation causing collapse. So generally, focal densities on the first x-ray are something you have to deal with, and they're almost always going to be a surgical lesion. So here's a patient where the lower half of the left hemithorax is more opaque than the upper half or the contralateral normal right lung. He does have mediastinal shift. It's not severe. And in this particular case, it's, it's not likely that it was horribly symptomatic, but you have to deal with this. And the most common lesion to give you a focal abnormality like that with sort of indistinct mar margins is either a cystic adenomatoid malformation or uh, uh, sequestration. And the two often coexist. And this was a, I think this was considered to be a, a, a combination of the two. It was a CCAM with underlying sequestration because there was a systemic arterial supply. Okay, this is a little bit more severe. You know, even though he does have significant mediastinal shift to the right, and he's got relatively poration of his right lung, you can see he's got a pattern in his left lung that's unique to that side. It's partially opaque with some cystic areas within it. And this is another patient with a, this one had a pure congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation and significant respiratory distress as a result with mediastinal shift. This is a less severe case of the same thing. You can see the lung, he, he does have mild interstitial lung disease bilaterally, but he's got a more focal abnormality in his left lower lobe with some cystic changes. Again, this is another CCAM, although in this case wasn't very, uh, uh, very large and probably was not causing much in the way of respiratory distress.
but it's something that does have to be removed surgically, and it ultimately was. No mediastinal shift in this case, because he is rotated a little bit to the right. So that's why his heart looks like a little bit to the right.